Hey, everybody, this is Alex. Welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge Podcast. Our movement is a result of the urban-rural divide in Oregon, which has been apparent in Oregon for as long as I've been alive. Anybody who's lived in Oregon for any amount of time knows that the Willamette Valley, northwest part of Oregon, is very different than the eastern part of Oregon, very different than the southern part of Oregon. And because of the Portland metro area being so populated and so different than the rest of the state, what we get is state level government that gets decided by the Portland metro area that then gets kind of forced onto the rest of the state and people are looking for solutions. All right, everybody. Thanks again for taking the time to listen today. Today we have Matt McCaw, who is from Greater Idaho. Uh, Greater Idaho is the official organization that is seeking to uh, move a number of eastern and Oregon uh, counties into the state of Idaho, which would essentially make for a uh, much bigger landmass, at least state Idaho, as well as population. Uh, but essentially, it would move both Oregon and Idaho's borders. Uh, Matt is originally from uh, Central Oregon. He serves as the spokesman for the organization. Uh and he is also a small business owner. And we wanted to have Matt on the podcast today because uh, Greater Idaho has been getting, I mean, obviously a ton of traction in Oregon, but then a ton of traction nationally as well. Uh, international traction, New York Times profiles, Atlantic profiles, CNN profiles. Uh, and the organization, I think in general, as we talk a lot about in this episode, has really signified the urban-rural divide and some of that kind of uh, I guess, you know, it's got boiled over basically in a way. So uh, we spent some time basically walking through the organization, spend a lot of time walking through what the actual process would be to make something like this happen. Uh, there is, of course, legal precedent and, uh, you know, things like this of this nature have happened, not for a very long time, of course, but basically Matt walks us through uh, essentially what all of the process would be in order to make something like this actually come to fruition. Uh, I think as well as I'm sure Ben and Reagan would agree with, it is very, very, very unlikely that uh, something like this would ever actually be allowed to happen. Uh, they would need approval from the Idaho legislature as well as the Oregon legislature as well as uh, the U.S. Congress. So uh, well, I think I'm very unlikely to happen, I think a very uh, important story for folks to at least be aware of since just considering the considerable amount of traction uh, that it has gained, I think Matt does an excellent job explaining the organization, explaining the cause, explaining why the cause came to be, uh, and then the specific steps basically that would have to be taken to make something like this happen. So uh, we'll go ahead and dive right into the episode. Uh, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. Go check us out on YouTube uh, where you can see me on video. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Oregon law imposes several ethical obligations on state and local public officials. State law also regulates and requires reporting by lobbyists. Harang Long PC's lawyers work with public officials and lobbyists who need advice on how to comply with government ethics rules. We also represent clients before the Oregon Government Ethics Commission when they are accused of violating those rules. Our deep experience with government ethics helps us evaluate issues efficiently and offer practical advice in what can often be contentious and politically charged circumstances. To learn more about Harang Long's government ethics practice, go to harang.com. That's H-A-R-R-A-N-G dot com. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge. Today, we are very excited to have Matt McCaw with us from Greater Idaho. Matt, how's it going today? It's going well, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Good, good. And uh, where, where are you at or where are you located generally? So I live in Powell Butte, uh, which is right in the very middle of Oregon, uh, just in between Redmond and Primeville. So if, if people aren't real familiar with Central Oregon, most people know where Bend is. Uh, we're about 20 miles northeast of Bend. Okay, nice. Do you still get the same general nice summers as uh, the Portland area? Or what's the kind of weather out there like right now? The weather in Central Oregon is perfect. It, we get winter, we get snow, but not too much snow in Powell Butte, and then we get beautiful summers. Uh, about 11 or 12 inches of precipitation a year. So it's sunny 300 days out of the year. You can see the mountains. It's a, it's a beautiful place to live. Okay, very nice. Yeah, my wife would probably highly prefer that over Portland uh, and all the rain. So that, that's good. 
Uh, but Matt, thanks again so much for for taking the time to join. So, uh, you know, tell us a little bit more about uh, Greater Idaho as an organization, kind of what the goals are, uh, your role with the organization, and then we'll we'll definitely get uh, much deeper into it. Sure. So uh, I'm the spokesperson for our movement. I've been involved for about a little over two years, two and a half years. Our movement is actually only about three and a half years old. So um, our movement is is a result of the urban rural divide in Oregon, which has been uh, apparent in Oregon for as long as I've been alive. So I, I was born in Oregon. I grew up in central Oregon. I lived in the Willamette Valley for 20 years before making my way back over here. Um, but anybody who's lived in Oregon for any amount of time knows that the Willamette Valley, northwest part of Oregon, is very different than the eastern part of Oregon, very different than the southern part of Oregon, the southwestern part of Oregon. Um, so we have this big urban-rural divide in Oregon. And, and because of the Portland metro area being so populated and so different than the rest of the state, what we get is state-level government that gets decided by the Portland metro area that then gets kind of forced onto the rest of the state. And it causes a lot of friction because a lot of the policy, a lot of the uh, rules and the way people want to govern their communities in the Portland metro area don't work for the rest of the state. It's not how the rest of the state wants to, to run their communities. It's not the values that they want to live their lives under. Um, and, and so you get this friction when, when policy comes at the state level onto these Eastern Oregon counties, Eastern Oregon towns, and, and Southwestern Oregon towns. So we've had this problem in Oregon for a very long time, and, and as long as I've been alive, and people are looking for solutions. And, and so there was a time in the state of Oregon when we've always had, a, not always, but we've had a Democratic governor for about 40 years. Um, but for a, a lot of those years at the beginning, we had a Republican legislature. There, It was Oregon was more of a purple state than the deep blue state it is now. Uh, and so that gave rural counties a little bit of voice, a little bit of a seat at the table, an ability to influence the state level government. That has changed over the last 20 years or so. And now Oregon is a strong majority uh, Democrat controlled at the state level. Um, and, and they had a super majority up until this last election. And what that's done is that kind of uh, give and take uh, you know, political tug of war that that you had between the red and blue that used to be part of the Oregon government experience. It's no longer that way. Where single party rule, whatever that single party wants, gets pushed onto the rest of the state. And again, that causes friction. That causes all sorts of, of you know, um, frustration amongst people who don't think they're being heard, don't think their government it represents their values, and don't think that that the people making decisions understand their way of life. And so uh, just to stay on the topic of the organization, so were, you are not one of the founders of the organization. Is that correct? That's correct. Or, yeah. So our organization was founded by just a few um, Oregonians, the rural Oregonians that we have this longstanding problem. They said, how could we solve this? You know, everybody's looking for solutions. Everybody understands that there's this urban rural divide. Everybody understands that there's this polarization and, and partisanship. Um, between the left and the right in Oregon, how can we solve this problem? And so it was just a group of, of local Southern Oregoners and, and Central Oregon, Eastern Oregon folks. They met at a pizza shop and they said, what if they had this idea, what if we moved the border between Idaho and Oregon and moved it to where the actual cultural divide in Oregon is so that the Willamette Valley would be Oregon and the rest of Oregon would become part of Idaho, which much better matches those people's values is much more the government that they want rather than the government that they currently have. So that was the initial idea three and a half years ago. And at the time, it actually included Southern Oregon as well. So at the time, if you see these old maps of our organization, it was to take about 75% of the land mass of the state of Oregon. Um, that's been adjusted as we've gone along the way. We're now down to just uh, Eastern Oregon, just the Eastern Oregon counties. And, and the decision was made right at the beginning by the folks that started this organization that we think this is a good idea, but let's find out what voters think. Let's take this directly to the people. And so that's been the strategy of the organization. Go directly to voters in Eastern and Southern Oregon and ask them, do you want your elected leaders to consider moving the border? And what we found is that in Eastern Oregon, we've asked in 12 counties whether they want that to happen. 12 counties have said yes. In Southern Oregon, we've asked in two counties, Southwestern Oregon, and in both the southwestern Oregon counties, we've asked in voters said no. 
Um, so that what that tells us is people in southwestern Oregon don't want to look at this as a long-term solution, but the people in eastern Oregon very much do. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, so, you know, and you had said this urban-rural divide has been lasting for, for decades at this point. Uh, Oregon, I would say, is, you know, always at least, I mean, somewhat been a purple state, right? I mean, George Bush almost won Oregon. I forgot if that was in 2000 or 2004. Uh, but, you know, this divide has been going on for quite some time, at least I think it would be a pretty easy point to argue. Was, was there a moment or a specific uh, maybe issue three and a half years ago that sparked this? Like, what was the, what were the founder, like, wh why now kind of is my question, if that makes sense. Like, was this something they were always thinking about? Or was there like a political moment or a policy moment where the founders are basically like, enough's enough, it's time to start this organization, it's time to try to do this? You know, I don't know that there was a specific incident that happened other than just this drifting apart the polarization I, I think most people would say that when donald trump got elected polarization kind of took on a whole nother level of polarization people really really disliked president trump people you know were, were really supportive very polarizing figure um so but this is not something that is necessarily been unique in Oregon's history. We've had movements similar to this before. We've had State of Jefferson. We've had other groups. Uh, there was a, a group that wanted to make a state of Eastern Oregon. And, and it goes back to the original problem, which is that you have two very different cultures that are pushed together in the same state, sharing the same state governance because of where an imaginary line was placed almost 200 years ago. Where that line is doesn't make sense because it groups two dissimilar groups of people with different values, different cultures who want different things for their communities. And so we've had this tension and we've had groups looking for a solution for a very, very long time. This group came along, polarization expanded during the, the Trump era. Um, and, and then on top of that, we had coronavirus you know, right after our organization got started, we had coronavirus that that also just supercharged our movement because, again, you saw this huge split and this huge rift in the state of Oregon between what the west side of the state wanted and, and the coronavirus policies, the pandemic policies they wanted and what the east side of the state wanted. And you had, you know, state mandates coming from the northwest part of the state being forced on the rest of the state that caused a lot of tension. Gotcha. And then so can you help us understand of uh, uh, in terms of greater Idaho, like is there specific boundaries that you all have in mind for this? Like is there if folks were to go over to your website, is there a specific map where uh, it's like this is what we envision basically as obviously I think it's 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 for sure an idea in a way, too. But I mean, it sounds like there's actually uh, from your all's perspective, specific borders to where you know, this is basically the area that we think is greater Idaho or would, or, you know, could potentially become a greater Idaho. Uh, where does that, uh, I guess, stop in terms of like, you know, is that like right outside of Bend and then right outside of a certain area kind of help us understand from like a geographical perspective what that actually looks like? Sure. So our movement is really about self-determination. And, and that's something that broadly almost everybody agrees on. People should have a right to, to choose the type of government that they enact over themselves and the way they, they build and govern their own communities. And, and again, this is something most people agree on. It's a core principle of the American you know, ideal. And so we are talking about moving the border so that we can group similar minded people. The people in Eastern Oregon are culturally, politically, economically, socially much more similar to Idaho than they are to Western Oregon. Um, so we're asking to move the borders that those people that want Idaho governance can get Idaho governance. And so what that does in reality is it says, OK, where do these groups, where do these cultures kind of lie? And, and so we have put our line, which is just a proposal down essentially the Cascade Mountain Range, carving around a couple different groups. So we carve around the Warm Springs Indian Reservation. We carve around the city of Bend. And the reason that we put our proposal there is because those places do not share the same culture that the rest of Eastern Oregon does. They vote differently. They, they, we, we assume that they would not necessarily want to be part of Idaho governance because they vote uh, more like Western Oregon than they do like Eastern Oregon. So you can use a line, you can use a border 
to group people together and get them matched up to government that they want that matches their values. That's what we're trying to do. So our proposal basically goes down the cascades, cutting around those couple of places, and and then takes all these Eastern Oregon counties who overwhelmingly vote the same way, have very similar cultures, um, very similar values. And, and as we're finding out after asking voters, would prefer to have the state level governance of Idaho. Gotcha. And help us understand from uh, a historical perspective, because I'm sure you or the other folks involved in the group uh, have done research on this or probably know this, but when was the last time that something like this in the United States had happened? Like, is there anything from the 20th century where a part of Vermont, per se, wanted to be part of another state and that was able to be successful? Uh, I can't think of any examples uh, just off the top of my head, but I imagine, of course, you all have done pretty significant research into this historically. What's kind of the use case for maybe your all's like a, a mindset we could use for something like this has been successfully done in the U.S. before? Sure. So so borders have moved multiple times throughout the history of the United States. There's a process for it. Um, it's called an interstate compact. Any two states can come together and change their border. And, and so this has actually happened relatively recently. Oregon and Washington actually moved their border in 1958. Um, and all it requires is two state legislatures to come together and say where the border is, it, it doesn't make sense or is unclear. We need to, you know, solidify where that's at. And that's in the case of Oregon and Washington in 1958. That's what they did. There was some dispute about where in the Columbia River, the deepest part of the channel, the, the language was not clear. They said, let's firm this up. Let's put the border in a definitive place that we know going forward. So the two state legislatures come together. They agree to put the border where they put it. And it, as long as they agree to that, sign a contract, gets signed off by the U.S. Congress, a border moves. Now, that was a very small adjustment. But throughout the course of the uh, uh, history of the United States, borders have been moved multiple times. Most recently, talking about doing something like what we're talking about. Uh, where you're moving full counties out of one state into another was in the late 1800s. West Virginia was created out of Virginia. And then after it was created, there were some counties that moved after the fact over into that state. So there is precedence. It was never assumed that when we drew a line to designate a state hundreds of years ago, that that line would forever make sense for that state. And, and, and our founders understood this, and they understood that states needed to have the ability to adjust those uh, those state lines. And so there's a process for it. It can be done. It's possible. There's precedence. And it's a matter of political will. If two states come together and say, this would work better for both our states and would benefit both states' citizens, they can make that border change happen. Gotcha. Okay. That's interesting. And then... Uh... So I, I want to talk a little bit about about the voting. So uh, you had said earlier that at this point, there's been 12 counties in Eastern Oregon that have basi basically voted uh, yes for this proposal. And there's been two counties in Southern Oregon that have both voted no. Uh, what exactly are people voting on? And then what exactly is happening? So like, let's say I'm voting yes on this proposition. What exactly am I voting for? Let's say I obviously get what's not happening if it doesn't pass, they would of course just stay. But what is binding, if anything, or legal? Like what, what is the outcome of these? Kind of help, help walk us through that. Yeah, it's a great question. So it, it's kind of a complicated answer and I'll try to simplify it as much as possible. But in the state of Oregon, to get a uh, question on a ballot, it has to meet very specific legal uh, specifications. It has to be legislative and not administrative. So you have to word things in a certain way and it has to require, uh, you know, legislators to, or, or elected leaders to do a certain thing. So because of that, we would have loved to gone directly to voters in Eastern Oregon counties and just said, do you want your elected leaders to pursue or work towards moving you into the state of Idaho? That would be the simplest, cleanest way to ask this. But we weren't able to do that in every county. So what we were able to do that approximates that is that we're asking in most of these counties, we're asking voters, do you want your elected leaders, your county commissioners to meet two or three times a year and discuss or promote your county's interests in a potential border change? So that's what most counties have voted on. Some counties have been able to vote directly on the idea because county commissioners, county courts in Oregon can refer advisory questions to the ballot. So in Wheeler County, 
they referred an advisory question and they basically just asked voters, do you want us to use tax dollars to try to move the border so that we can be part of Idaho? And Wheeler County mm -hmm. vo uh, voters said yes at 59%. Josephine County had an advisory question and it lost 51-49. But again, it was, it was the most direct way to ask voters, do you want us to, to pursue making this county part of Idaho? Um, so to answer your question in a short way, the 12 counties have all voted on something slightly different. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of those counties have voted to require their commissioners in their county to meet and discuss how to promote the county's interest in a border change or you know, pursue making a border change happen. So uh, what was the county you said that's now spending tax dollars exploring this? Was that Wheeler County? That was Wheeler County. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so they so put that, that was on the ballot last November, I believe. Wheeler and Morrow Interesting. County. Mm -hmm. So, so they are basically in Wheeler County right now. They are, uh, I'm assuming the city council or whoever is probably doing this. They are spending funds uh, to do what basically? Is it like, planning to to merge with idaho is it like the kind of promotion side of it uh i didn't know there was actually group spending i i i've read about the resolutions and that kind of makes sense in terms of like having meetings and things like that but i didn't know there was sure. counties that are actually spending tax dollars right now promoting this it's very interesting yeah and so we also have an advisory question coming up in trip county so that's going to be our 13th county that we just found out the county court is going to put forward an advisory question to their uh to our citizens so i live in trip county we've been working to get this on the ballot for a couple of years county court has finally agreed to put an advisory question and in trip county's case they're going to ask voters uh do you want the court to uh, let state legislators know that trip county wants to be part of idaho essentially. So again, there's several different ways that people have had a chance to weigh in on it. But the overarching theme is people want their elected leaders to pursue this as a long-term solution. And, and that's kind of what all the questions get at in, in their own way. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, I am curious of if you all have done any polling or just kind of the reaction in general. Uh, obviously, I think there's a number of people who are supportive of this in various counties because obviously some of the counties have voted yes for this. Uh, tell me about, have you all had experience, like uh, have you had a, a town hall or something in Portland or Multnomah County or Washington County kind of discussing this? Like, I, I'm curious to hear what Oregonians kind of, you know, as you consider to be what would be Oregon rather than greater Idaho actually kind of feel about this proposal in general. Yeah, so there has been polling done. So, so this idea, this solution has broad public support. So there was polling done in Idaho by Trafalgar Group, and they asked Idahoans, would you accept these 15 Eastern Oregon counties? Would you want to add them to the state of Idaho if you knew that they would vote like you and that they would not be an economic burden? And, and people over two to one said yes in Idaho. We would want these 15 Oregon counties. There was polling done by Survey USA in Northwest Oregon, so just the Northwest part of Oregon, and they asked people a whole bunch of questions about Greater Idaho, but one of the questions that stood out the most was they asked people in Northwest Oregon, should the state of Oregon look at changing the border as a solution and what that would mean for the state? 68% of Northwestern Oregons said, yes, we should have this conversation. So what that tells us is people in Oregon know what the problem is. If you've lived in Oregon at all, you understand that Portland, the Willamette Valley is very different than the rest of the state. And, and if you've traveled at all in Eastern Oregon, you know it's so rural, it's so different, completely different culture, completely different way of life. People understand that. They understand why policy for the Willamette Valley doesn't make sense for Eastern Oregon and why policy for Eastern Oregon doesn't make sense for the Willamette Valley. And, and people are ready to have this conversation. So that Survey USA poll had all sorts of questions they asked. There was a ton of interesting things in there. One of the things that, that that survey asked about was it asked Northwest Oregonians how much money they'd be willing to spend to keep Eastern Oregon as part of Oregon. So, Alex, most people in Oregon don't understand that because of the way Oregon's tax structure is uh, and because of our social service system, Western Oregon, especially Northwest Oregon, ends up subsidizing the rest of the state pretty, pretty heftily. Um, mm -hmm. Most people don't understand that, that, that a lot of their tax dollars don't stay at home in Northwest Oregon. They get sent to the, the far reaches of the state. 
And this uh, survey asked people, how much money would you be willing to spend to keep Eastern Oregon as part of Western Oregon? The number one response that got the most answers was zero. Most people in Northwest Oregon don't want to spend anything to keep Eastern Oregon. Most people in Northwest Oregon want to keep their tax dollars at home. Only 3% of respondents in that survey said they'd be willing to spend the amount of money that they currently do to, to keep Eastern Oregon as part of Oregon. So I think that there's already broad support to have this conversation. As Western Oregonians better learn the facts about uh, our state and the way our state spends their money, I, I think you'd see support go even higher for that. So tell me a little bit about from the Idaho side of things. And I, I think I do remember the two to one survey that you had talked about before where you know, Idahoans basically said, yeah, yes, this would be amenable to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but tell me about it more from the, the legislative side of things. So like, uh, as the governor of Idaho publicly said he supports this, uh, have there been bills introduced in the Idaho legislator to explore this options? You have legislative, I guess I'll call them champions that you're working with. Uh, what is the kind of political side of that look like? And then uh, I want to ask you about the Oregon side of it next. Sure. So the process is to get the two state legislatures. They're the decision makers. They're the ones that have to do this. So we are asking people directly through our votes. Do you want your elected leaders to do this? But those vote, the, the, the citizen votes don't really have any power. All they can do is, mm -hmm. is be a data point for their legislators to know what to they want them to do. It's the state legislators that are the final decision makers. So we have to get our two state legislators, legislators talking, Idaho and Oregon. This last legislative session in Idaho, which is already over, we introduced a bill. It was introduced by uh, Representative Boyle, who is a representative in Idaho along the, she, she her district is along the border there. And she uh, introduced our bill and it was a memorial and it was basically authorizing the Idaho legislature to invite Oregon to start these talks. Um, that passed the Idaho House. So that passed the Idaho House oh, pretty really? handily. It did. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, and, okay. and we have we have a lot of support in Idaho. And, and this makes sense for Idaho. There's so many reasons why Idaho would benefit from having these eastern Oregon counties. They would be adding 400,000 like-minded citizens. They'd be in, adding a ton of natural resources. They'd be adding space. Idaho is one of the fastest growing states in the, in the country because people are pouring in to get the conservative governance. They're, they're fleeing these West Coast, you know, um, liberal or, or left leaning governance. And they're, they're pouring into Idaho. That's causing a lot of stress on Idaho's infrastructure. This would give them more space to expand. It would push Oregon law further away. There's a lot of benefits to the state of Idaho and Idaho citizens and Idaho legislators see that. So. We Our memorial passed the Idaho House. We got into the Idaho Senate. Uh, it kind of stalled out in the Idaho Senate because nothing was happening in Oregon. And so it kind of became uh, one of the least priority bills. And, and the session ended before we got a chance to be voted on. Um, but we had a lot of support in Idaho. We feel really good about where we're at on the Idaho side of things, both with the public and the legislature. Gotcha. And then uh, shifting over to the Oregon side of things, which I think would be a much harder sell in general. Is there any member of the legislator right now who has come out and supported this idea? Or has there been a bill introduced or uh, give us kind of the overview into that? Yep. So there has been a bill introduced in the Senate, and that's from Senator Linthicum and, and Representative Reschke was a co-sponsor of that, I believe. So, yes, mm. we have legislators who are supportive of our movement. Uh, we have not gotten as much traction in the Oregon legislature as we did in the Idaho legislature. And there's been um, some reluctance by the Democratic leadership to even just talk about our bill or discuss our bill. But we think that Western Oregon legislators have a lot to gain by having this conversation and, and that this would be a huge benefit to Western Oregon financially, uh, politically, and, and just, you know, the whole idea of self-determination. What's been happening in the state of Oregon over the last six weeks with this walkout is, is a symptom of, of the issue that we're trying to solve. You have these two very different cultures that are not getting closer together, not growing closer together. They're actually growing further apart as far as what they want for their communities and, and how they want to, you know, build their communities and, and live their lives. 
that's getting further apart and it's causing more and more friction all the time. I, I was reading somewhere that this was, I think, the fifth walkout in the last, you know, so many years um, mm. by, by the Republican uh, legislators. And that is a symptom of this problem that we're trying to solve. Our movement is saying there's a better solution than constantly, than constant gridlock, than constant forcing policy on each other that we don't want. We could get both sides of the state government that they actually want. Western Oregon should have the government that Western Oregonians want. And, and they should not be held back because people in Eastern Oregon don't want those same things. And, and likewise, uh, you know, the same is true of Eastern Oregon. We should get the government that we want. We can do that by moving the border and, and getting the two sides of the state government that they actually want. And so if, uh, just so I have this process correct. So the state of Idaho, uh, uh, so actually, I, I guess a little bit further explanation on the process. So mm -hmm. would the state of Idaho basically pass a bill saying, let, let, let's say, let's say both, both state legislators agree to this. Mm -hmm. The state of Idaho would pass its own bill basically saying these are our new borders. The state of Oregon would essentially need to pass the same bill, which would then be signed uh, by the governor saying, these are our new borders. And then after this would then go to the US Congress, where both houses would have to sign it, would both houses would have to vote on this and the president would vote on this. Do I have that right in terms of process? Kind of. So so it would be an interstate compact. And, and so interstate compacts are something that several of them get done every year in the United States. It's an agreement between two states. So what mm -hmm. would happen is these these memorials that are in the Idaho House or in, in the or Oregon Senate are essentially bills to authorize their own legislature to begin talks with the other state. So if both if Idaho gets their memorial through, say, say we Fast forward to next year, Idaho moves their memorial through the Idaho House and the Idaho Senate. Oregon decides, hey, this is a good idea. This would reduce gridlock. This would give us more tax dollars at home. This would give us the ability to have the kind of government that we want and implement the kinds of policies we need for our communities. If they decided they wanted to move that bill forward and they passed it, then the two states could come together and, and come up with a contract. So what that would probably look like is hearings, you know, public input, um, there would be study groups that, that would look at all the different details that would go involved. At the end, they'd write up what does the new border look like? Where does it go? What are the, all the details that go along with that? There's going to be things that have to be considered. There's assets. There's debt obligations. You know, we're talking about moving 9% of Oregon's population. So it would make mm -hmm. sense that you start with 9% of the, the state's assets, 9% of the state's debt, and, and kind of as a starting point for negotiations. But the two states would negotiate all that out. They'd come up with their plan. They'd put it in an interstate compact. Then it would have to get signed off by those groups. But historically and traditionally, interstate compacts are, are typically signed off by the U.S. Congress because, and especially in this case where you have a red state and a blue state coming together, if two states come together and say, we want to do this because this, may, this is the, to the benefit of both of our state's citizens, it's hard to see why the U.S. Congress would say, no, don't do that. They, they would traditionally, when two states have agreed to do something, if there's no reason for the U.S. Congress to intervene, they just approve. Gotcha. Yeah. And I was actually about to ask you how that would work from like an asset debt perspective, because, yeah, I mean, there's government facilities all over eastern Oregon. As you said, money comes in. To, that's uh, interesting that all those sorts of details would basically have to be negotiated out also. Uh, and then uh, final question, just kind of on process before I ask you a couple more philosophical questions and then uh, also just kind of some practical questions, but uh, the the actual switch itself, right? So let's say Congress signs this, uh, this agreement, basically the greater Idaho is now set in stone. Uh, how does that process work? Like do people get Idaho IDs? Does Idaho start opening up government offices in these areas? Like What's kind of that final step if this was to all basically come through kind of in uh, from the perspective that you all wanted to? Yeah, you know, that's hard to say exactly because there is going to be such a negotiation process. And, and so it's hard to say what, you know, when when the when the state line changes, how much time will people have to get an Idaho driver's license? I have no idea. The, the two state legislatures will figure that out. The state of Idaho will figure that out. Um, but essentially what will happen is once that line moves, 
Eastern Oregon begins to get their governance from the state of Idaho. The laws of Idaho apply to Eastern Oregon and, and you'd move forward. And Alex, you know, one of the things we always say is that people change state level governance every day. There are thousands of people across the United States that change their state level governance every day. This is not something there, there are people that want this to be such a complicated thing that they say, oh, it would take you 50 years to solve all the problems. We don't believe that that's the case. People change states all the time. They move. They figure out how to register their businesses, how to get their taxes paid, how to get new IDs, their licenses this is not, this doesn't have to be something that's super complicated. This is something that people can figure out. You give them so many months to, to achieve whatever, you know, the process is. And, and it, within those months, it would go on and Eastern Oregon would be Idaho. Western Oregon would now be the new Oregon and people would function as they always have. Gotcha. No, and thank you for, for that. That whole framework is, is very helpful in general, just to kind of walk through each of the steps. Uh, now I want to ask, uh, you know, kind of some uh, philosophical questions, maybe also just kind of about the, I guess, the movement in general. Uh, it has got to be crazy, I imagine, to be you and the folks that you work with and have profiles in the New York Times. Uh, I know that there was an interview with you with CNN. Uh, I mean, really, I, I when I Googled Greater Idaho earlier today, preparing my show notes, there was about 350,000 uh, different articles, videos, whatever you might want to call them that I could have clicked on to learn more about this. Uh, uh, my general question is, has it been surprising to you to see this? Again, I don't want to call it a national issue in the sense of like, I don't think many people, uh, let's say in New York right now, are thinking about greater Idaho at their time, but you've clearly gotten a lot of national attention for this idea. Uh, what has that been like to be so under the spotlight, I guess, especially from, again, a lot of national media that really don't actually cover Oregon that frequently in general? And certainly don't cover Eastern Oregon, uh, so, you yeah, know. Exactly. <laughs> certainly don't cover Eastern Oregon, right? Like right. Uh, most people obviously have no idea where places like Ontario are and yes. stuff like that. So. One of our favorite things is when we get journalists to come out to Eastern Oregon and, and they they start in, you know, Powell Butte here where I am and, and they drive all the way across Eastern Oregon and it's hours and hours of driving and there's very little, you know, uh, population and towns and but there's beautiful country and, it, and it's great for people to see just how vast and open eastern oregon is it is a different world out here it is so different from the Willamette valley it's it, geographically it's different culturally it's different um you know it, it it's just a, it, it it's just very very different and, and we it it doesn't make sense for us to be getting our government sharing our government with this other culture on the other side of the state that's, that lives hundreds of miles away and is very different when the people in Idaho are very similar to we are geographically, economically, socially. Um, but back to your question, your original question, you know, uh, we have not been surprised that this idea has caught fire because most people involved in this movement are just like me. I was somebody who I was never politically active other than voting and paying attention. Um, and, and after the pandemic and after coming through all that, I, I said, I've got to get involved somehow. And I had heard about this movement and it clicked with me. I said, that makes all the sense in the world. Like, like that's a solution. That's a solution that would actually fix this problem we've had in Oregon for as long as I can remember. And it would be a win-win for both sides of the state. It would help both sides of the state. It would, it would uh, further our goal of getting people government that they want that matches their values that makes policy that works for their communities which is something that almost all of us agree it's a really good idea it clicked with me it clicks with most people and when we ask people in eastern oregon they say the same thing oh that would be awesome our number one response we get is that would be amazing is that even possible can you do that mm. there, there's this thought or, or just because it hasn't happened in so long people forget that you can use borders to, as a tool to make people's lives better. They're not set in stone. They're not sacred in some way. They're imaginary lines that we use and we use all the time now to group similar people to make people's lives better. Um, we do this, re we redistrict every 10 years, to try to get people better representation that, that gives them more voice. We use them in other ways. People have, have don't realize you could use state lines to solve this problem. But when they hear that you can, 
they say, oh man, that makes a ton of sense. That would solve the problem and it'd be a win-win for everybody involved. And it's not just people in Oregon who hear this. I do podcasts all the time or radio interviews in other states like New York, or I just did one in Colorado or Illinois, because the same problem Oregon has is a problem that a lot of states have. The urban and rural communities have very different cultures and, and very different ways they want to organize their communities and live their lives. And so that causes political tension all over the place. We could use state border relocation to lower that political tension and, and create win-win situations for, for lots of groups. So it's it's been awesome. I never expected to be on national news broadcasts or international news broadcasts, um, but I'm, I'm not surprised because it is a good idea. Most people agree with what we're trying to do, which is this self-determination and, and get government for people that makes sense for their communities. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and I, I was reading one of your interviews where I think the interviewer, I don't think they called you a secessionist, but it was they asked you if you were trying to secede, which I know was kind of your your point more, you know, this is self-determination. We should be able to vote for this. Obviously, a theme that has played in the U.S. since our founding. But uh, I guess uh, my question is, you know, it, it, to any of the folks that you work with, right, is has there been any talks of certain counties just saying we're done basically we are like we are declaring ourselves a part of idaho now like has that been a discussion or that's something you've heard people say but not something your group agrees with since i mean you have talked to me totally about process right like this yeah. in order to make this happen we need state legislator one to come together state legislator two to come together congress to be able to vote obviously a uh, substantial hurdle to have to get to for that but uh just kind of curious of your thoughts on that well, you know, people are frustrated and people are looking for solutions. And, and so you will hear, you know, people have all sorts of ideas and a lot of people want to create their own state. And, and I think, you know, personally, I'm all for creating our own states. I, I, I believe that we should use the political process to solve problems and, and make people's lives better. And um, but there's a bigger hurdle to creating a new state because that involves all these other things like having two state senators. And, you know, like it, it, it's it's we already have a high enough hurdle to get over to change a state line. Creating your own state would be that much more. But as to whether, you know, our movement and our supporters, we are dedicated to using the political process that's here. We're, we want to use the process that uh, our founders put in place to solve problems, make people's lives better and create win-wins for everybody. You know, I lived in Western Oregon for 20 years, 20 plus years. And, and, you know, I have friends and family that live in Western Oregon. I want my friends and family in Western Oregon to have the government they want without feeling like people hundreds of miles away are forcing a way of life on them they don't want. I, I want them to have what they feel they need for their communities also. And, and so this, this uh, idea, this movement is really all about creating win-wins and, and getting people, um, you know, government they want, lowering political tension. Yeah. And then uh, I'm curious because you probably get this question, I'd say quite a bit. Uh, what do you say to people who tell you that you should just move, right? Like, uh, I mean, you may have a family farm or family business. Obviously, you have ties from the sounds of it in Oregon, right? But uh, folks who don't want to be a part of Oregon anymore could move to Idaho. They could move to Montana. Uh, of course, similarly with red states, if you're, you know, uh, very progressive and living in Alabama, it probably makes more sense for you to live in Portland, right? Uh, what's kind of your response to the folks who, I'm sure you get that question all the time. Every interview and, and almost every person who doesn't like <laughs> our idea, that's the first thing to say, why don't you just move to Idaho? We're talking yeah. about 400,000 people and we're talking about communities that have been here for hundreds, you know, a hundred plus years, we're talking about families that have been here for generations. They own ranches, they own the land. You know, the people in Eastern Oregon own their land. There, there's a misconception that the state of Oregon owns all this, this land inside its border. That's not the case. The state of Oregon governs the land inside that border. The state of Oregon does own some land, but in Eastern Oregon, it's less than 1% of the land in Eastern Oregon. About half the land in Eastern Oregon is owned by, by citizens, like by people like me. The other half is owned by the federal government. So we should not, people should not have to abandon their communities, tear their families apart, tear communities apart to have government that makes sense for their communities. And, and most people 
agree with that idea. Most people agree with the idea of self-determination and communities know best how to build and, and govern those communities. So, you know, when people say, why don't you just move to Idaho? A lot of people do because they, they get frustrated and they get fed up and they, they say Oregon's never going to change. Um, but we believe it, it, it would make sense and it would serve the most people the best to move the state line rather than ask 400,000 people to pack up, destroy their communities and, and leave the state. Gotcha. And I uh, did want to ask to, I'll ask uh, one longer question and then uh, one shorter question. You've been very generous with your time, Matt, today. Thank you. Uh, what are basically the, the, the goals for, again, I, I'm saying five years, that's a little bit arbitrary, but uh, I mean, you have big hurdles to, to clear over, right? In order to, you know, enact basically what you're trying to do. Uh, I mean, it would, and again, not be unprecedented, as you said, but it hasn't happened in uh, hundreds of years, basically, at this point. So what is kind of the roadmap of uh, the organization in terms of maybe like different levels of success, right? I mean, clearly, you're having, I'd say, quite a bit of success so far, given that 14 or 12 counties have basically voted for a resolution promoting the idea, basically, at this point. But uh, what are kind of some of the big initiatives that you're working on right now? What are kind of some of those goals, you know, that you're hoping for in, in the near future to keep things moving forward? Our overall goal is to get uh, the people in Eastern Oregon and Western Oregon government that they want that, that makes sense for their communities and, and to solve problems. So to that end, we want to see the border move because we believe that's the very best solution to this problem. We believe it's the long term solution. We believe that that the, the proposal that we put forward can be a win-win for Idaho, for Eastern Oregon, for Western Oregon. Um, and so that's what we're pursuing. And, you know, as far as how long might this take or what's the five-year plan, we're at a point now, there's been an independent economic analysis done that has kind of laid the, the groundwork of what would that look like for Eastern Oregon to join Idaho? And, and there's a ton of information. It's a 99 page report. It was done by Points Consulting in Moscow, Idaho, somebody that's very familiar with the Northwest, a company that's very familiar with the Northwest. And, and there's 99 pages of information about how would this affect economically Eastern Oregon, Western Oregon and Idaho if this were to happen. So, um, so, so a lot of that groundwork has been laid. At this point, it's, it's really a matter of political will. If we could find the legislators in Western Oregon who decided, you know what, this is a good idea. This would, we would be done with gridlock. These walkouts would be over. It wouldn't be an issue. We'd be able to enact the policy that we actually want in our, our state without interference from people that have radically different values that live hundreds of miles away. If we had a majority of legislators who decided this was an idea worth pursuing, this bill could pass in the next session. And, and we could have those talks beginning as early as next summer. And, and you know, you, you do that and then you've got, uh, you know, hearings and, and, and community input for a year. This is not something that, that has to be a decade out. We're at the point where as soon as enough legislators believe this is a good idea we're pursuing, this can happen. In Idaho, we're essentially already there. There's enough legislators in Idaho ready to have this conversation. We just need to get the Oregon legislators there also. Um, and that's what our goal is. That's what we're pursuing. And, and, and along the way, we'll continue. We still have three counties in Eastern Oregon that have not had a chance to weigh in on our proposal yet. Truck County is going to get a chance to weigh in next May. We'll continue to try to get voice for Eastern Oregonians, give them an opportunity to have their voice heard, and then advocate for those 12 counties that have already said that they want this solution to, to be enacted. And actually, sorry, Matt, one one more additional question but before mm -hmm. my final question. Is there any plans to take this vote to Western Oregon counties? So say, put a resolution forward in Multnomah County, basically saying, would you like to remove these Oregon counties essentially from Oregon, kind of yes or no, basically the opposite resolution that you've been doing in some of these. Is there any plans for that or is that something that you've thought about? It isn't actually. We, I mean, we haven't really considered that. We we started this process thinking that we wanted to ask the voters in Eastern Oregon and Southern Oregon, Southwestern Oregon, um, and that's what we've been doing. We haven't even got to all those counties yet, so we haven't thought about going to Western Oregon yet and having votes. But it is, you know, to that end, though, this is a conversation that the state of Oregon needs to have. There's a lot of people in our state 
who understand why it would make sense for Eastern Oregon and Western Oregon to no longer be part of the same state government. And it's a conversation that needs to be had. Great. Well, Matt, thank you again so much for, for taking the time to join the podcast. Uh, if folks want to learn uh, more about uh, what the organization is doing, or maybe view that economic paper that you talked about, or maybe get in touch with, uh, with the organization, uh, where would they go to do that? So they can go to greateridaho.org and we have a huge FAQ. People have a ton of questions, you know, both personal, like, well, what happened to my, you know, my particular contractor's license? Or um, we've tried to answer as many questions as we can as far as the process and, and everything that's involved. It has the economic analysis, those surveys we've talked about, all that information is there. Um, people can sign up for our, our newsletter get hooked up with our social media, donate, buy merchandise. All of that is at greateridaho.org. All right. Well, Matt, thank you so much again for taking the time to do the interview. And everybody, thanks again for listening. Uh, make sure to check us out on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and give five stars. Thanks again. Thanks, Alex.